Thank you guys for joining me this afternoon. Um, this is my thesis defense. My name is Leanne Ray. Um, as Jason said, I'm a candidate for the um, MFA Studio Art and Design track. Um, before beginning my thesis, I would also like to start by thanking those who helped me to get to this point. So I'd first like to thank um, my thesis committee, Shannon, Ashley, and Amir, my dear friends and my cohort, um, Brittany and Gretchen, uh, my partner, Nick, our program director, Jason Burrell, and the art gallery staff. Without each of you, I would not be standing here today without a doubt. So thank you so much. This presentation is in support of my written thesis and artistic practice. In this thesis defense, I will discuss how my personal relationship with memory, research into memory, personal history, artistic influences, all influence my studio practice. I've been interested in how I understand memory during my studies in this program, and I'm interested in memory because of my own struggles with recalling details in my memories. Trauma and stress are shown to have a direct impact on one's ability to recall memories. Within my own drawings, this has occurred. When attempting to make a drawing about a stressful or traumatic memory, um, I find it difficult to recall specific details or events about the space that the memory has occurred in. There have also been moments when creating a drawing that a memory has resurfaced. I freely allow these moments in time to layer in my drawings, allowing distant and present, distant past memories and present memories to collide in one flat picture plane. It is important for me to first highlight what in my research has impacted my work and to define episodic memory. Episodic memory is defined as the ability to construe specific episodes from one's past experiences. Episodic memory is defined as when, where, and what is defined as the when, where, and what happened in memory. Endel Telving coined the term episodic memory in 1972. Telving is a Canadian uh, psychologist and cognitive neuroscientist, and he makes the case for episodic memory by defining it as the difference between knowing and remembering what transpired. An example of this would be that I know I've met my grandmother, Phyllis. I know that she's a short, stout, old woman, and that she has a tough personality, but I can't quite remember the details of her house. I can't remember if it was carpeted, if there was wood panels on the walls. I can't remember if she had an old chihuahua. I can't quite remember those details about her. So evidence has been found in recent studies involving mice that show stress and trauma have a direct impact on their, detail, on their ability to recall details and memories. So how does stress and trauma impact my own memory? This question is one that I often ask in my work, as my memory is hazy and not reliable. When I make drawings from memory, specifically from childhood, I'm often told by my family that I may misremember details. My, fail my failure to recall every detail in my memory is what makes this process so interesting to me. I want to discover what I may remember and misremember through my visual language. It is essential to my practice that my work can freely shift between moments of clarity and moments of abstraction. The moments of abstraction are chaotic and deviate between distant past and present. In this drawing, Chorus of Memories, I find myself referencing memories associated with old bedrooms and more recent memories such as falling ill with COVID or Hurricane Ian. The act of tangling these memories into one drawing rather than focusing on one singular event visualizes the act of recalling a memory. This tangling of these memories removes the viewer from a space that can be cemented into reality. When removed from a specific when removed from a specific place, these drawings become more about memories emerging into my conscious thought. Such as the memory of a friendly roadrunner bird at a zoo trapped in a small enclosure. Or a dresser from an old bedroom. Each of these memories emerges simultaneously in my creative process and find their way into my drawings. The process of resurfacing, memory, resurfacing memories is something that I also see in Francis Bacon's work, seemingly arbitrary memories emerging simultaneously, such as a dog performing a trick or a boxing match having over, happening over a railroad. Bacon, however, is not concerned with there being any sense of reality or clarity in his work. Many of his paintings are more closely aligned with surrealism than mine. The objects I use in my drawings function as personal symbols. 
and they often represent specific relationships or events in my work. One constant symbol in my drawings has been the lamp pictured here. This lamp, the bed, and the nightstands are objects that very often find their way into my drawings. This furniture set purchased by my boyfriend for our first apartment together. And after spending so much time with this furniture set, especially after my boyfriend moved for a new job in California, I found that this bedroom set became symbolic of myself and my boyfriend. After I moved, I pushed this bed up against the wall, got rid of one of the lamps, got rid of one of the nightstands, and I found that this symbolized my newfound isolation. And after losing this apartment and some of my furniture to Hurricane Ian, this bedroom set survived. This bed, the nightstand, and the lamp are extremely precious to me. And when I find myself making a drawing about a specific memory that may be traumatic or stressful, I know that I can insert something from this bedroom to bring myself comfort and help me navigate myself through the drawing. I first used this strategy in this drawing, Dead Memories, which is about the act of recalling a traumatic memory. <clears throat> I wanted, to share this, I wanted to share this memory in this drawing without being too descriptive of the event. I did this by drawing myself in a vulnerable state, standing in front of my bed, half awake with only a shirt on. Behind me is my bedroom set, providing a sense of comfort due to its personal meaning. I think of my work as this pendulum that needs to shift between moments that are clear and moments that are unclear. Even though I often find myself working through imagination, I find that it is important, for my, uh, important to my work to bring photos back, to have a sense of reality. When working from imagination, I tend to let go of any uh, references to reality. I focus more on making each element work together harmoniously in one flat picture plane. But occasionally that shift from reality is too chaotic and I find myself seeking clarity in my processes, which brings me back to working from a photo. <clears throat> When I find a photo that I'm inclined to work with, I always initially start by drawing and trying to get every detail correct I can from the photo. But inevitably, I'm, I begin to make a shift either because I perhaps drew something too small or I drew something too dark, and I'm now forced to react and implement information, information from imagination into that photo. This is something that happened in this drawing. I drew the figures in the cabinets and slowly realized that I drew them too small and I was forced to react to that. I decided to make the figure's expression more neutral, to make this drawing less about my mother and I, and more about the space that surrounds us. I made the doorway more like a flat graphic shape to give the viewer a place to rest their eyes. And I decided to place my pet dog, Max, merging from that doorway. These aspects drawn from imagination are clearly rendered differently. They have more of a gestural mark, which is an indication of my reliance on memory. The drawings that have this shift from concrete reality to imagination are often the drawings that I feel are the strongest. Hmm. The figure's presence in my work has always been significant. Whether it be the evidence left of a figure, portraiture, or personified objects such as my lamps. I use the figure in my work to explore and express which memories or feelings may be tied to whom, whom I'm drawing. Another artist who, used the figure, who uses the figure in a similar way is Lucian Freud. When looking at Freud's painting, Large Interior, London, W9, the viewer is left with several questions. They are, however, given some insight into Lucian Freud's thoughts at the time of creating the painting, without him having to ever be present. This painting is bizarre. It shows his mother seated in the foreground, a lover nude, nervously reclining in the background, and this odd pairing perhaps shows Freud's inability to interact with women without thinking of his mother. This implies a strained relationship between the two. Even without the context of his personal history, this painting provides a variety of narratives that a viewer can leave with. I believe the same, this same phenomenon within Freud's paintings also occurs in my drawings. The portraits of my mother and father, Eyre and Margate, show the relationship between my parents and myself. Starting with the drawing on the right, Margate, my initial goal in this drawing was to recall a fond memory between my father and I at a day in the pool. 
This drawing depicts an old photo of my father and I spending the day in our pool. And on this specific day, I wanted to pretend to be a hairdresser. So essentially I spent hours pretending to cut his hair and pretending to dunk his head in the water and wash his hair. And slowly I was dunking him too, too much. <laughs> you can see it in his face. I chose to omit details that I felt were unimportant or that may hinder this drawing, such as the statues in the back or the cartoon bird on the swimsuit. However, in doing so, I made this drawing about a strong little girl applying pressure onto her father, which insinuates that I feel my father is under this constant pressure. When I came across this photo on a visit to my parents' house, I felt a strong inclination to draw it, but I wasn't sure why just yet. But after completing the drawing, I noticed that the steps I took away from my reference photo might indicate an uncomfortable feeling. Precisely in the way that I rendered my mother, the addition of the dog and the nightstand. How I rendered my mother, especially in comparison to the other figures in my work, comes across as doll or puppet-like. And I believe this drawing is rendered differently because of the strained relationship between my mother and I. There's a strong overlap in terms of psychology between my work and the work of Lucian Freud. This is evident with the addition of seemingly arbitrary objects um, that attempt to pull the viewer's attention elsewhere and the stark contrast in how both myself and Freud render our mothers when compared to the other figures in our work. Lucian Freud in contrast, however, is less wary of describing his figures in a harsh way. He does not hide his feelings in his paintings. I think of the pets in my work as figures as well. I am often forced to draw my pets exclusively from memory. My cat Fireball and my dog Max are unfortunately no longer with us and they passed before um, cell, phone phones were as, um, cell phone cameras were as prominent as they are today. So when drawing these pets, I'm pulling from memories from childhood. These memories are happy, just like the bedroom furniture. I can use pets to make a difficult drawing easier for me to create. Self-portraiture is something that I always return to in my work and is almost always my default starting point in a drawing. After years of scrutinizing myself in the mirror, I feel as though I know every aspect of my body intimately. And if there is something that I would like to explore in my content, I feel most comfortable using myself as the vessel to elaborate on that story or idea. Often when I'm speaking with my peers, they're shocked to learn that I don't like my appearance when most of my work uses self-portraiture. My response is always that I draw myself because I am able to scrutinize and study myself in a way that I cannot when it comes to drawing others. I utilize self-portraiture and self-scrutiny to navigate my own and others' memories. As an example of this, after spending time with my father in Massachusetts over the summer of 2022, my head was filled with these stories of distant relatives that I'll never be able to meet, such as my grandfather who passed away long before I was born. My father told me a story from when he was my grandfather's caretaker that stood out to me in particular. He would often come to my grandfather's house to check on him or deliver groceries. After my, um, and my grandfather's bird would often talk to him during these visits, telling stories that my grandfather and his friends drunkenly shared the night before. This story struck me as my father often talks about my grandfather, but had never mentioned a bird up until this point. I found myself drawn to visualizing my, my father's story until I realized I had no idea what my grandfather looked like. There was never a picture of him shared with me. Um, there was never a picture of him shared with me. And instead of calling my parents up and asking them to fish a photo of him out of one of their photo books or trying to imagine what he may look like, I decided to draw myself in my, grand, in my grandfather's home from imagination. Despite not having a photo reference, when I shared this drawing with my father, he immediately knew which story I was referencing. Self-portraiture has this power to convey, to convey more than just a portrait of the artist. It can tell how the artist feels about themselves and others on several levels. An example of this, um, for example, when looking at um, Egon Schiele's work, his, specifically his self-portraits, um, you can see how he scrutinizes himself and how he is far more critical of himself, especially in comparison to the portraits of the, the to the portraits of the woman that he lusts after. I find myself drawn to his self-portraits because of this level of self-scrutiny. 
This level of scrutiny is also seen in my own work, specifically my drawing, The Canary. My face is gaunt, tired, and depressed, and my skin is somewhat translucent, revealing bones and musculature. Egon Schiele, in contrast, however, exaggerates even further what he dislikes about his appearance and what he values in others. In contrast to Schiele, the self-portraits of Kath Kowitz often depict a sense of loneliness and depression. These portraits are more about the emotional, emotional turmoil in her life caused by the war. I'm, off, I'm drawn to the portraits, drawn to her prints. I'm so sorry. I'm drawn to her prints as they share a sense of reality with the viewer regarding the war. Kowitz prints help the world understand what is happening in the war. However, the sense of reality and justice is not something that is present in my own work. Regardless of their approaches to self-portraiture, I, I find myself drawn to both Kowitz and Chile because I can relate to their level of understanding um, of oneself and desire to depict that self. When I began this body of work in January of 2022, I wanted to focus on my bedrooms and their associated memories. I was interested in what details might be lost along the way and what I may un uncover within my memories. Prior to this body of work, I painted figures who were curled up and unassuming. I wanted to make a body of work that would contrast those figures. In this new body of work, I wanted my figures to be large and more engaged with the bedrooms that they inhabited. I started first with this drawing, Dead Memories. This drawing was not only meant to be a contrast to my previous oil paintings, but it was also about the act of recalling a memory. I found myself looking very closely at the etchings of Albrecht Dürer. His Christ-like figures that consumed the page and exerted confidence were something that I felt my portraits were laughing, lacking. From researching these Christ-like figures and Dürer's etchings, I decided to place myself at the forefront of my compositions to make myself appear more confident. This confidence is a big contrast to the work that I was making previously. All my figures previously were cropped and not very active in the picture plane. While working on this drawing, Dead Memories, getting every detail of the bedroom was essential. I did not let myself stray from the photo reference. And if I did want this drawing to be about the act of recalling a memory, I would have to allow myself to work from memory more often and get information incorrect. To achieve this, I began studying the drawings of Edgar Degas. His drawings were mainly as the studies for his paintings, but his drawings have this quality that his paintings do not have. Degas' drawings feel more like an impression of the moment in time, as he freely omits and obscures details that are in the moment feel unimportant. My drawing dead memories lack this impression of a moment in time that I saw in Degas' drawings. Wanting to take more of an impressionistic approach, I decided to render this drawing, I don't remember everything, differently. In this drawing, I decided to work more loosely from my reference photo and rely more heavily on my memory of the room. I found this approach rewarding as I could let go of my precision and loosen up. I allowed myself in this drawing to rely exclusively on my memory and in doing so, I rendered this drawing less tightly. When comparing the details, specifically the lamp, specifically in the lamp and the nightstand, you can clearly see the difference in how the two are rendered. Dead memories, which is drawn exclusively from a photo, is tight and clean. I don't remember everything has loose mark making and more freely emits information because it is from memory. After completing I don't remember everything, I came across this painting from Degas named Interior. This painting was interesting to me because it forced me to become an investigator. I found myself wondering what happened? Why is there a man blocking the door? Why is there a woman half dressed? Why is the bed perfectly made? Is this before or after an event? This line of questioning was something that I wanted to bring into my work. This diptych, The Bed in Your Shadow, are my attempt at forcing myself and the viewer to go through a similar line of questioning. When these two drawings are separate, they seem almost innocent. But when they are together, they create more of an ominous narrative, similar to Degas interior. Degas and I um, are both interested in sharing a moment in time or a story with the viewer, but I do so through drawing and I am far less concerned with there being a sense of reality in my drawings as I work from imagination, memory, and photos. I work from a photo reference, imagination, and memory quite often in hopes that the practices will begin to inform each other. 
and eventually there will be no need for a photo or a still life. My memory and imagination will su suffice. My studio practices and processes are constantly in flux. I allow myself the freedom to work with, that, to work with whichever medium I may feel be necessary at the time. In my studio practice, the phrase process over product rings true. In my work, I emphasize the processes required to create an image, all the mistakes all, and all the risk taking that lead to a final product, such as the shift of a placement of an arm or a scratch in my copper plate. Throughout undergrad and grad school, I found myself drawn to printmaking. The processes required for creating an etching or a monotype forced me to slow down and more thoroughly think out my design choices, um, which is something that I always take back to my primary practice of drawing. Printmaking initially was used as a form of communication for it enabled artists to share their artwork or their message with a large number of people. In the 18th century, Japanese artists used printmaking to make multiples to share poetry and illustrations, such as, um, such as seen here in this Yukioi style woodblock print. Later on, specifically during World War I and World War II, artists like Kath Kolwitz found themselves making prints to share the tragedies of the war with the world. The ability to make multiples and quickly share an image gave printmaking a unique power. In more modern times, contemporary artists use etching for many reasons. Lucian Freud, similar to myself, uses it as a way to work out ideas. The majority of the prints that I make currently are etchings. When I go to make a print, I actually rarely make a preliminary sketch. I usually work my ideas out on the plate. With this plate in particular, I knew what I, knew what I wanted to make, and I knew the specific angle that I had in mind was tricky, so I made a sketch first. Etching specifically forces me to slow down in terms of process. Each step of making an etching requ requires devoted attention and patience. You have to first prepare your plate, then wait close to an hour for your ground to dry, and then wait for the plate to etch in an acid bath. Unless you use spit bite, an additive stinky process that uses nitric acid to etch the plate before your very eyes. The shiny, almost pink areas of this plate are, are what is left behind when the chemicals are wiped away. Although spit bite is fast like drawing, it is not predictable. You never know how deep or what exactly will even etch when using spit bite. Once your plate is complete, you will then load your plate with an oil-based ink and run it through the printing press. The pressure of the press forces the ink to release from the grooves and into your paper. You never know which areas will or won't pick up ink until you run that print. The unpredictable but also slow and precise nature of printmaking is something that I always try to bring back into my drawings. I think of this process as something that keeps me from making the same drawing over and over again. A series of prints that clearly found its way into my drawings is my bedroom series. A series created using six to 10 different copper plate etchings and as the act of thinking of how to physically construct a room using several plates, each plate containing one item, a dresser, a bed, a window, or even a room. This process of curating my iconography was a massive influence on my current body of work. This process of combining and layering symbols within one flat picture plane is something is seen in my drawing and never ends. Charcoal, ink, and soft pastel are materials, are materials that I have used for several years. These materials lend themselves to memory. Both dry mediums um, like charcoal and soft pastel and wet mediums like ink used together allow me to work both permanently and temporarily. The mark left by dry mediums are not stuck to the paper forever. I can erase or push them back using my hand, but ink is absolutely permanent. It stains the paper thoroughly. Even though charcoal and soft pastels can be erased or pushed back, there's a permanency to the mark, unless you damage the paper by digging into its many layers with your eraser. But simultaneously, these stubborn marks can feel gestural. This stubbornness of the mark is often seen in my drawings upon close, upon close inspection, specific, particularly in this drawing pigeonholed. 
When viewed from afar, this drawing seems almost peaceful, but when viewed up close, the paper is clearly distressed from my labor of attempting to push and pull information in and out from the paper. This push and pull gives an illusion of dimension. Through this push and pull, the evidence of the previous marks becomes visible, such as the shift and change seen in the foot of this drawing. This circles back to the idea of process over product. If it takes 30 tries to get the foot correct, I will, em I will emphasize that process over the product. In comparison, Jenny Seville also uses, utilizes expressive mark making using charcoal and oil paint to visualize pentimente, which is the record of her initial mark um, evolving into that final image. Within my work, I also attempt to not hide my processes or initial thoughts to show my evolution of ideas and memories. Jenny Seville's work, in contrast, however, seems to focus on an additive process. She is constantly building upon this framework, rarely ever erasing or pushing information back. I like to be both additive and subtractive when I'm drawing. It is important that my drawing has a push and pull. When teaching drawing, I refer to this as the battle within your drawing. To force myself to be in different modes of speed, to be both additive and subtractive simultaneously. It is important for me to have this push and pull of tone and line and adding charcoal back into the paper and using the eraser to ex expose the white of the paper to give this illusion of white pastel. When in fact, I rarely use white pastel as most white pastels lean blue, which clash with the warm tones of my charcoal. This act of going back and forth between modes allows me to make a drawing that has dimension, where I get to decide what recedes into the background and what emerges into the foreground. Having a sense of visual hierarchy is something that I think about from the conception of a drawing. When I compose a drawing, I'll first gather my references, including photos, familial stories, and personal memories. When I drove past this old broken wooden table on the side of the road, it evoked a specific memory of driving through the neighborhood with my mother in search of new furniture. When I was growing up, my family had some financial hardships that rarely allowed us to get new furniture. Whenever we needed something new, my mother and I would go out on big trash pickup day to try and find it. I usually quickly, uh, I usually early on abandon this photo reference and try and work for my memory and any stories associated with the drawing. Within this specific drawing, I strayed away from my reference image and used white ink to mimic the headlights on the furniture that my mother and I would come across late at night. Similar to composing my bedroom prints, I find it crucial for me to be able to stack different memories and objects together to play with the viewer's understanding of perspective in my drawings. I want a viewer to question their understanding of when and where these drawings occur and eventually their understanding of their own memories. Through my artistic practice, I'm hoping to better understand my own memories and discern what is true and what is made up. Not only am I questioning my own memory, but I am asking a viewer to question their own. The use of old familial photographs in my work not only holds meaning for myself, but for the viewer as well. The inherent nostalgia in these drawings forces a viewer to imbue their own thoughts and memories into the drawings, where they can possibly remember a day in the pool with their father and begin to question what they may exactly remember from that day. Often when recalling memories, especially ones from childhood, I find it difficult to discern what is reality and what is made up. As children, our minds are vibrant and filled with diverse ideas that can make it difficult to know what truly happened. Within this drawing, I'm attempting to do just that. I had no real relationship with my grandmother, Phyllis. She tragically died when I was in elementary school. But the small drawing, the small memories I do have of her are strange. I remember a record player, or was that from a story that my dad shared with me? I remember she had an old chihuahua, or was that just something that I made up as a child? These are the types of questions that I ask myself when recalling a memory. I hope to continue this pursuit of understanding um, that I hope to continue this pursuit of understanding my memory through drawing even after I finish this program. And I'm excited to see where my drawings take me next in this process.